Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for the Bay 101 lecture series. Um, this is our fourth of a five part lecture series. Um, I don't know if many of you have been to Horn Point. Um, we have some folks that have attended more than one of these lectures, but for those that uh, this is your first one because you, you love models, um, Horn Point is one of four labs uh, that the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science has across the state. So we're part of this organization. Um, we have a lot of expertise, but given today's topic uh, by Kenny Rose on models to understand Chesapeake Bay, I thought I would just emphasize some of the other modeling work that, that happens here at Horn Point. Uh, we have folks that are uh, doing models to understand and predict uh, flooding from storms and sea level rise in the bay and along the Maryland coast. Uh, we're also having models that look at the impacts of oysters and improving the water quality of the bay. Uh, we have models that predict the, this dead zone of no oxygen at the bottom of the bay that happens every year. Um, also very practical models that um, look at different flooding scenarios and if you have seawalls versus marshes versus living shorelines, which are most effective to protect the land uh, along the edges of Chesapeake Bay. And most importantly, we're educating uh, some great graduate students that are using models for their uh, masters and PhD work because more and more scientists uh, use models to understand our, our natural environment and you're going to hear about that from Kenny Rose today. Uh, Kenny worked at the Oak Ridge Lab National Laboratory in LSU before joining us here at Horn Point in 2017. Um, he uses a variety of models to help understand fish populations in the ecology of marine and fresh waters and Kenny's worked many places across the globe. Uh, recently, he's used models to understand the use of fresh water and diversions, how that affects fish populations in San Francisco Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. And he oversaw how effective the monitoring program was in the Gulf of Mexico to look at the restoration after the oil spill. Uh, Kenny serves on a bunch of national and international uh, committees uh, designed to look at the effect of climate change on, on uh, the ecology of the oceans and seas. So it's really a great honor that we have Kenny to speak with us today. Just some procedural issues. Um, you could submit questions at any time. Um, if you have a burning question that um, mentions, Kenny said something you don't understand, we could, I'll, I'll stop him and ask that question, but we'll certainly entertain all questions at, at the end of his 30 minute talk. Uh, this is being recorded, so um, if you have to leave and, and you're going to miss it, you'll get a chance to, to see it, or if you're really excited about it and want to tell your neighbor, uh, we'll, we'll provide that link with you uh, tomorrow. So uh, as I said, we'll be recording this, and I'll, I'll give the screen over to Kenny. It's a great honor to have him speak with us today. Thank you, Kenny. Thanks, Mike. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to take a peek under the hood a little bit of what uh, modeling is and, and, and try to weave it together in the sense of what, uh, in particular, about the future of Chesapeake Bay. So uh, we're going to do what, why, and how uh, as best we can. Uh, so what is modeling? So uh, by definition, it, it's a way to represent a much simplified view of the system. <clears throat> if you represented the entire system in all its details, uh, you would have the system. And then you'll see it uh, creates some problems in trying to make predictions about things. Uh, it's also very impractical to do. And there's conceptual models and mathematical models. And uh, as you can see, uh, those two uh, scientists are, have a bunch of equations, something, something. And uh, it, modeling is a bit of an inact, inaccurate, in, uh, inexact science. Uh, and that's kind of what makes it uh, uh, challenging. So uh, very briefly, uh, modeling, we, we work with the rates of change. Uh, statistics works with how many organisms are there, how much nitrogen is there over time, uh, the bottom row. But that's the solution to the model above. And you'll see that that may seem odd at first, that why don't we just try to predict how many fish are there or how much nitrogen and where's nitrogen going as it comes down the watershed into the bay. But in fact, uh, we, we do this a lot in everyday life. We work with rates of change. And then we have to solve that to figure out how much is there. 
and I'll show you a, a couple of examples. Um, probably the simplest one is for those who have any investments or are retired, uh, you're always worried about the rate of, of return on your investment, which is the top row there uh, in terms of it being a rate of change. These are two very, very simple models. Uh, uh, and and uh, we use them a lot to, to explain models. And in fact, the one on the right is actually used in, in some management cases. Um, and so we work a lot with what makes things change. And we try to write that in the green and the, I guess that's pink in the top row. And then we use computers and math to solve how much of that will be there. So if N is fish, we want to know how many fish, and that's the solution to that equation. Uh, and those two different equations give you two different solutions. Uh, there's usually confusion with these models between what are simple models and what are complex models and behavior. So that model there is about as simple as you can get. Uh, uh, X is the number of, uh, let's say, fish at uh, tomorrow. And it's a function, uh, it's the rate of change because it depends on how many fish are there today. Uh, and then this parameter R. And then these are solutions to that for different values of R. And you could see a very simple model can easily generate quite complicated behavior. So uh, it, it, doesn't, you, it doesn't necessarily mean that simple models give you simple results and complex models give you complex results. So, so why do we model? Well, there are many important science questions that uh, modeling you'll see is, is needed for. Uh, it's used a lot in making management decisions. Uh, you could imagine fishery quotas. You could imagine in Chesapeake Bay, how much should we reduce nitrogen coming from the watershed to achieve the goals we want in terms of the quality of the water of Chesapeake Bay itself. Often a lot of money is involved in these decisions. And, and the ultimate goal, of course, is to have a sustainable ecosystem that also uh, uh, provides the services we, we use from them, such as uh, fisheries, recreation, uh, water supply, uh, depending where you are. It could be agriculture, it could be shipping. So why do we do this? Well, we would not do it if we could have eight multiple Chesapeake Bays. So if we had replicate bays and we could treat some of them and not others and see what happens, uh, then uh, uh, I probably would be in a different field um, right now. Uh, but we can't, there's one Chesapeake Bay. And so many things happen at the same time. And so when we wanna know, did a particular action in the watershed of reducing fertilizer applied to farmland improve the clarity of the water? We also may have a drought year, a very uh, heavy rainfall year. We might have a warm year. And it gets difficult to tease apart how much of what you see is due to uh, the action you took. We, the bay is complicated, but it's, it's understandable. Uh, uh, we actually, with models, we, we clearly want to know about the present, where we are. We also like to look at the past because uh, it helps us tell us whether the model's doing a reasonable uh, representation of what happened. But the big one is the future. Uh, and uh, the cartoon on the lower left is a mental model of what could happen, A, B, or C. And I could tell you from experience, the one thing that won't happen is B. Nothing stays the same. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's tricky that way. Another reason we, we do these kind of uh, models that we represent in a computer, and I'm gonna explain how uh, uh, next, is um, because uh, when we're looking toward the future, many of our, our restoration actions in Chesapeake Bay and many other places, they're not for improvement tomorrow or next year. They're decades into the future. And there are very large investments and we wanna make the investment so that in 20 years, 25 years, 50 years, we will still be generating the benefits from that restoration that we planned on. And so climate change is a big thing with all of our kinds of models. Uh, and what you can see here is uh, that's, that's the global average surface temperature uh, and the change. 
And it's projecting out to the year 2100 under different ways uh, we will conduct ourselves in terms of our activities. And so what we do is there's a set of models that did that. And those are actually models of the entire earth. And then we've, we really uh, are not interested in what is going to happen on the East Coast, which is the scale of those big global models. So we downscale them to regional and even local um, uh, information, which then becomes, for example, in Chesapeake Bay, rising sea level, warmer oceans. This is a generic picture, obviously. Changes in how the animals move around, changing precipitation. Um, uh, so uh, uh, we need to be able to say that uh, the investment now in restoration or in management uh, is not only going to work in the next two, three, five years, but is going to be robust to the possibility of a changing climate uh, 20 and 50 and sometimes 100 years out. So if you do all that kind of downscaling, which I, is not what I do, uh, that looks really hard to me. Um, uh, you can come up with changes in temperature for the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So now you can think, okay, if I know that it's going to be about two degrees warmer and that's how it's going to happen, if I wanted to reduce nutrients coming in like nitrogen uh, through Pennsylvania, through the watershed, uh, I have to plan that it's going to be warmer uh, like that in 2055 and 2045 is on the left and 2055 is on the right. That's not that, that far away. Um, and so that comes, becomes in their planning and the Chesapeake Bay program is doing that. So that's, the, so we did, what is it? Uh, how, uh, uh, why do we do it? And now how? So, so how do you generate these very uh, often pretty pictures and stuff? Well, they can be simple or complicated and, and most all of the modeling we do is not, is not, we're not inventing new mathematics. It, it's, it's very standard, well-developed mathematics. What's new is how we use the mathematics to represent the physics, the chemistry, the biology, and in many instances, people are part of the models as well. Uh, the simplest example would be, of course, trying to manage a fishery and, uh, and the harvest, right? But there's also uh, people up in the watershed. Uh, where are people going to build homes? How is that going to affect the runoff? So a, a lot of what I do is involves collaboration and teamwork. And, and the running uh, idea is that, is that I know a little bit about a lot of things, but I don't know a lot about anything. And uh, that's because I go around with my toolbox of these math tools and computer tools and work with people who are experts on the various topics. And we're quite lucky that both at Hornpoint and at UMSEs in general, uh, there's lots of people I can go work with um, who know a lot more about each of these topics than I do. And so, you know, you might think of a model and the cartoon on the left is back in my day, they, they actually built a physical maze. Now, of course, it's done on a computer. And on the right is the idea that you have to identify what details are relevant uh, to your question. And so there's the, the true cat and then the approximation of the cat as in a model. How do we do it? Well, we make a lot of assumptions and we, we do know a lot about these systems, but we also don't know uh, everything and there's uncertainties. Uh, sometimes we make assumptions and then they're challenged later when more information comes, comes around. Um, and um, normally we would have thought that that predator would have chased the rabbits and uh, uh, this suggests we need to revisit that assumption if that's the one we made. And then this is the idea I mentioned that you, you may not know it, but you, you actually do a lot of the math that are in these models already. Uh, that's, your, that's your investment and you assume different rates of return with different color lines. And in fact, if you look carefully, it looks a lot like that ecological model I showed you on the left-hand side before. The, uh, and so you think about it as a re rate of return. We think about it as the change in the number of fish, the change in the concentration of nitrogen, uh, the change in the concentration of uh, almost uh, anything, sediment. And then we write out those equations and then we solve them. 
So that kind of thinking is, it may not be as, as odd as it first sounds. My particular specialty is, uh, is following uh, each individual organism in models. And so this is a, uh, a, a cartoon of that, sometimes called agent-based modeling, sometimes called individual-based modeling. And uh, what we do is we, we actually model each, in my case, each fish, and then we add them up to get what the total's doing. So why, why would we do that? Because sometimes it's hard to write those rates of change with the total numbers. It, too many things complicate that. So instead, uh, we, we talk about how each fish changes and then hope we can add it up and get to those properties, those population, those food webs that changes. And you can do this with, with many things. It's done with colliding galaxies where the stars interact with each other. If you think the traffic in Boston has gotten better, they use an agent-based model to help with the traffic signaling there. Um, anything you can think of, we can some mostly do with an agent-based approach, but it's computationally intensive. What's an example of, of, of all these kind of ideas? I'll give you a very quick example. This was, we followed individual fish in Chesapeake Bay in three dimensions. First, there's hydrodynamics. That's where water goes. Uh, temperature and salinity, which as you could imagine is important to many of these organisms. And then the water quality, because that's a target of management is to improve the water quality by reducing nitrogen and increasing the clarity. That is taken up by algae and then they, the zooplankton eat them. And then we get to the fish model. So we follow uh, millions of individual fish throughout this uh, every uh, 30 minutes. Uh, they decide where to go. Is it too warm? Is it too cold? They decide, is there enough food here to eat? I'm going to eat it. How much did I grow? Is it time to reproduce? Uh, I don't want to get eaten. Is there a predator nearby? I better go somewhere else. And we do this over and over and over and over again. And remember, co computers are really not smart at all, but certain things they do really well, like repetitive calculations, individuals, individuals, individuals. And so we can generate and you look at the top row, uh, that's when we started these coupled models, which we do a lot of, uh, uh, linking different models together. You decrease nutrients, it's today's nutrients, and the right-hand column is increased nutrients, and it's different kinds of years. So what's nice about this is we can go in, and this is how much uh, low oxygen water is in the Chesapeake Bay uh, through time in the model, in our virtual world, but look what we can do. We can mix up dry years and normal years and wet years and put them in different order. We can do all these things that you would not be able to do by direct measurement. You have to have measurements to build the model, but then the model lets you play with different kinds of conditions that maybe haven't been observed. And I'll tell you personally, uh, those who are familiar in California, they had an unprecedented three years of drought. Um, that was in none of our scenarios in the model. Uh, because we, we, never, we didn't really think it could happen. Uh, and so these models let you do those kinds of what if games. You could also substitute the future uh, if you wanted to. And then we generate uh, how many fish will be there and where they're gonna be. So that's the red means there's a lot of anchovy there. Uh, looking top down, uh, there's still layers there, but we just added them all up and collapsed it like that. Um, and so the idea here is, is you could maybe get a little idea of how you go about maybe doing these models, but more importantly, why you're doing them. And it's to be able to investigate future conditions and different kinds of conditions to make sure your decisions are robust to, uh, to what may happen. Uh, ideally, we would have 10 Chesapeake Bays and we can test it directly that way with measurements like an experiment but we don't, and so we go into the virtual world. Uh, this is uh, uh, another example, just to give you a visualization. The Gulf of Mexico, where I came from, uh, drains 40% of the United States. Uh, and of course, we all know about hypoxia. It's the same in the Gulf of Mexico as Chesapeake Bay. Growth of phytoplankton gets stimulated as they die they get isolated near the bottom and uh, they get decomposed and, and suck up the oxygen. And so right now we're, we're looking from uh, the gray, whoops, sorry about that. Right now uh, we're looking at the, the dark gray is the low oxygen that 
fish cannot breathe in. And this is our simulation where the white dots are the individual fish that we programmed how they would react to this. And we're just circling around. Notice the gray is changing through time as well. And the, some individuals get exposed and some move out of the way. And, um, and it's, it's, uh, it's a way to visualize, uh, again, what's happening in these kind of agent-based models. And, uh, uh, and this simulation was, was quite interesting because we repeated it with, with uh, reduced nutrients coming in. And it was quite uh, a dramatic change in the shape of that and then how fish reacted to it. So uh, how do we do this? Well, the cartoon on the left is a very popular cartoon among modelers. They have equations. It says then a miracle occurs and they have the answer. And the old, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. Uh, what, I, what I have right there for you on the right uh, is probably the most boring thing I've ever put on a slide. It's actually computer code that I wrote for that model I showed you earlier of anchovy that uh, we write. And some of these models like that one is 5,000 lines long and one typo and it won't work. That's why we say computers are really not smart at all, but they're very fast. And so we actually take all those ideas, what the experts and, and as say, and what the managers say their questions are, and we put it all together, come up with our equations of the rates of change, and then put it into the computer to let the computer solve it. In theory, we could solve it in our head, but it would take us a long time to do that. This is our new, I had to throw this in, this is our new high performance computer at uh, Horn Point Lab. Um, and th the top left uh, in the red checkered shirt is me in graduate school at the University of Washington. Uh, I, I assume everybody would have recognized me if I hadn't said that. And that IBM PC there came out three years after that picture was taken. And now the Dell computer I'm showing you on the left is hundreds of times faster than that old IBM and our high performance computer is hundreds of times faster than that Dell, modern Dell that you see there. When we got this, uh, I looked at it and I thought, where's the rest of it? Uh, and it, it shows you how, how much computing has, has uh, advanced. And it's really benefited us uh, at Horn Point and many other research institutions uh, in terms of what we're able to do uh, with these models. I'll tell you that the, uh, um, how do we get to the Chesapeake Bay? The Chesapeake Bay has a series of models that are really, they're considered just the gold standard of, of this kind of modeling of looking uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, way on the left is a land use change model. And that is how land goes from uh, forest to farmland, what kind of farmland there's an air shed model, which is the air stuff, nitrogen coming down through the air. Um, that feeds in to another model, and that's the that first blue arrow on the left. That feeds into the estuary model, which is the bay itself. And I showed you that's where like the anchovy model. And then all these things are coupled together and simulated to figure out the optimal mix of things to do in the watershed to get the water quality in the estuary as good as possible. And that's at that bottom right. You can see BMP is best management practices and you want nitrogen, phosphorus and sediment to go down and you want water quality and DO to dissolved oxygen to go up. And you could do it, you have to account for population growth, that's people, fertilizers, land use changes, um, and this, this set of models was, was more than 20 years in development. I'm not involved with it, so I can say it is uh, nationally and internationally considered just the standard for, uh, for doing that. And uh, now, we're, uh, now I'm, I'm more involved and we're thinking of how do we relate that to fish, crabs, and, and uh, I almost said shrimp from Louisiana, to fish and crabs uh, in the bay. Uh, and so, so this is used to go all the way back and say, what combination of actions uh, could I take in the watershed? Uh, reduce nitrogen fertilizer here, 
uh, capture runoff uh, from overland flow here. Uh, what happens to all this nitrogen as it traverses down all the way into Chesapeake Bay? And then you go back and say, well, let's try this and maybe that'll work better. Uh, and maybe it'll be cheaper to do. I just tell you, because uh, uh, I have about, I think I have about four, I have about six minutes left. Uh, so uh, Chesapeake Bay is not alone in, in this kind of modeling, this kind of restoration. Uh, uh, they're quite a bit ahead of many places in the modeling part for the, for the water quality. You may have heard about these TMDLs and uh, they've been in the news lately. Um, uh, and that's, that's the management tool to reduce the nutrients coming in. But um, on the left-hand side is uh, the top left is the California Delta. And all those green things you can't read, those rectangles are various restoration projects for the California Delta. Uh, the bottom is the Gulf of Mexico, which has a, a coastwide plan for, for doing that. Um, both of these involved extensive data collection like Chesapeake Bay uh, and modeling um, and similar kinds of models, I, I, I will say. I will say the California Delta is a little more contentious uh, uh, than Chesapeake Bay, uh, but um, it's, uh, it's a place where uh, uh, California's economy is dependent and California is either the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. And so there's uh, quite a bit involved there. These systems don't have to be enormous though. The, the top right is a system I worked on in Texas and that is the system. He's standing there in his, up to his knees uh, and it's a tiny little fish uh, at the top there uh, that's endangered and uh, they are trying to, San Antonio wants to pump groundwater uh, uh, to, for development and what would happen to these tiny fish? Uh, then you also get on the bottom left is the removal of the Kalamath Dam to restore habitat. All of these used extensive uh, models. In fact, the title of the report we wrote for the National Academy of Sciences for the top uh, example was evaluation of the predictive ecological models for the Edward Aquifer. Um, you'll also see the models are never, almost never done because this was an interim report as part of phase two. That, that's a hint. So what I've tried to uh, very quickly uh, show you is, is uh, uh, as part of Bay 101 is modeling and, and Chesapeake Bay. Uh, I could go on for a long time. And in fact, I've been home for a long time. So uh, I can really go on for a long time uh, talking about this. I, I do miss the interactions uh, at work. Uh, I tried to cover a little bit what, uh, what is the models? And basically, uh, one person characterized it as super serious video games. And not video games in terms of uh, entertainment, but video games in terms of a virtual world in which we can experiment and play until we got the, um, uh, until we can almost try to optimize uh, our, our actions. Um, and then we talked a very little bit about why, but the whole idea with why is the future and it's our version of a, of a scientifically based crystal ball, uh, which is based on data, but uses these ideas to project forward. I can tell you on that graph I'm showing you, the one prediction that almost never is true is that simple line that continues that trend there. Uh, and then I showed a little bit about how, uh, and, uh, and, and it's uh, uh, mostly done on the computer. It's, it's not really new math, but it's the way we put it together to address these ecological uh, and biogeochemical and climate questions. So I tried to give you a little peek under the hood, uh, as, as you could see. Uh, and um, I will tell you that, uh, whoop, that didn't work so well, but the Chesapeake Bay program, the, addition, the, the decision support uh, is, uh, is a really uh, something that is, is quite impressive. Uh, how they've developed these models and it, it has not been easy, it has not been cheap and it has taken a long time, but it really is a, is a way to guide the restoration. Uh, I wish I could say, uh, I hope to see you at the lab, uh, hopefully soon that would be uh, possible. Uh, Mike introduced the lab to you. And um, with that, I think it is uh, 531. 
So I will stop and see if there are any questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Kenny. And, and yeah, there are quite, quite a few questions coming in. Um, so one question is how accurate have the Chesapeake Bay models proved to be? You know, they've been going on for a while. Um, how, what's the litmus test? So uh, they, they've proven to be, uh, I, I would say, uh, we have to talk about accuracy and precision, right? So accuracy means that the kind of the answer looks about right. Precision is how much confidence do you have in it? And they've turned out to be uh, fairly accurate for uh, the questions that were asked of them. That is uh, changing activities in the watershed, what happens to the water quality in the bay? Uh, but uh, the precision is another question and, there, and, and that's gonna become an issue under climate change and future climates. Uh, uh, luckily, uh, uh, they had the foresight, the Chesapeake Bay program and, and others to have an extensive monitoring program throughout the bay which has really grounded those models in, in a lot of uh, very good empirical information that other systems don't typically have that, that longer extensive stuff. So I, I think they've been uh, uh, shown to be quite good in terms of uh, water quality. Um, as you get broaden your questions and head towards maybe fish, uh, that becomes uh, more of a challenge and they have not been, uh, that was not their purpose, and we're thinking about that now. As a, I'm a member of the of the one of the advisory groups, and uh, and that's one of the things that we've been discussing. Right. Well, these are great questions as usual from our audience. This is from Mary Sue. Will you speak to how a lag in data will impact policy decisions, i.e., extreme rain events that lower salinity and impact the quantity of oysters that may be landed? Um, yeah. So, uh, as you know, we're all, uh, uh, we do much better with um, nice, smoothly changing environments uh, and organisms and chemistry uh, that's very cooperative. Uh, as you start talking about either extreme events or even in more general sense thresholds, uh, it becomes a, a more challenge to to represent that, um, I would say we're 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 pretty good on the chemistry part, and that's probably because I don't do that, so it you know it looks good to me, kind of thing. Uh, we're not good at doing that as we go to uh, bigger and bigger organisms and up the trophic scale, uh, and that's because there's so many interactions: uh, who eats who, who competes with who, uh, and and stuff that and uh, feedbacks that uh, it becomes quite the challenge to make short-term predictions. The longer the prediction is out, has its challenges, but it tends to average these shorter-term extreme events. And so you have to tailor uh, your representation of these things in your models to those questions. Um, uh, so for example, we're actually quite challenged to predict how many fish will be there next year. Uh, we do better if I was trying to predict how many fish on average would be there over the next 10 years. And, that, and that's because we're able to, uh, we're able to um, re uh, average out over these, these episodic events. Um, but from the organism point of view, sometimes they're very, very important. So there's a movement now in, in global climate change, uh, which focused a lot on changes in average temperature uh, I was just, just reading today uh, for a proposal. Uh, people are saying it's the variability in temperature that might be most important to the organisms, the warm warms and the cold coals. Um, so we, we can do it, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's challenging, which is, uh, uh, but, but doable. It's a little messy. Here's a question. Can Kenny comment on how the coupling between the basic Bay model in the agent-based simulations of fish populations. So how, how are you gonna do that? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Uh, um, there, there, there's generally uh, two or three ways to do that. And you could imagine as our problems become, you know, cross physics, chemistry, biology, uh, people, uh, 
that that this coupling you, you you don't want to build one big model that tries to do everything right you 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 break the problem apart and then you couple them and coupling can be quite tricky because it, it, basically how coupling works is you run model a and and uh the output you somehow feed into model b and then the output of b goes into c so you might run the hydrodynamics model and feed that resulting temperature into a into a water quality model and then feed that output of chlorophyll into a zooplankton model and feed that output into a fish model. So the approach we're, we're considering is, um, is approaching it from, from a, you know, what I showed you as an example. What are some representative species and simple food webs that would tell us a lot? Uh, and coupling them directly to the, to the earlier models in the link in the chain. The other way is to not try to model uh, what the fish are doing, but model uh, what habitat the fish would experience. And that you could imagine is a little simpler because we're pretty good at modeling temperature. We can probably model food, predators are hard, but, uh, and then we, we can break the problem apart and look at habitat changes. And then we have to discuss, if you have more habitat, will you get more fish? So that's kind of the two strategies. Uh, and I think uh, what, one thing we do a lot in this kind of modeling is we try several approaches and we try to, to constrain the answer, bound the problem. You know, it's not a number, it's a range of numbers, but, but we try to make that range uh, useful to decision makers and, and managers. So, um... What are the recommended courses, majors, and languages to, le to learn to gain these model modeling abilities and skills? Ah, that's a good question. Um, so, uh, well, one way to answer that is is my background. So, I, I'm I'm not a typical, uh, perhaps, scientist or faculty member at at Horn Point or or UMSIS for that matter. In, in is that I I don't get wet at all. Uh, I, I am a complete computer jockey, um, and I always have been. And that, that's not typical. Uh, most people, you know, uh, are much more balanced and versatile than I am, and they diversify. They collect some data, they model. Um, and, and my background actually is in biology, but also a heavy dose of mathematics. And so uh, I would recommend to anyone, uh, majoring in math is, is really, um, great. Uh, first of all, I'll tell you, there's very few of you. Uh, you know, you're in classes, <laughs> very small classes, and they really want you to take the classes. Um, and, and, and getting a, a, good, uh, a good dose of mathematics uh, is, is probably the, one of the keys. Um, and, and then, of course, learning the ecology and the chemistry and all that is, is absolutely necessary. But, but uh, my background was in, was in uh, actually at the University of Washington in quantitative fisheries. So I'm, I'm a true number jockey. Um, the languages, uh, uh, a lot of it these days is a, is a language called R, uh, and it's just the letter R. And you can do um, some of this in R. Uh, it's more statistical, but you can do qu quite a bit of this. And, and we're doing some active research projects right now, like ocean acidification effects on winter flounder on the East Coast is being done in R. Uh, the big, big models are, are still done in, in those languages that I showed you my picture of that I learned back then in Fortran. Um, uh, and then to help you use it, there's languages like Python and, and uh, C++. But the big computers are, the whole idea is to run it fast. And so they don't, they're not going to let you run a slow language on there. So uh, learning to, one advantage to learning to code in those languages is they're all very similar. They're all sequential languages. So if you learn one, uh, C or C++, uh, you, you, it's just grammar to learn the other languages, right? You, once you master the logic. Um, so uh, it, it, those kind of languages, now there are very much higher level languages like MATLAB and, uh, and stuff, um, but they, and they can do a lot, but they're not uh, going to do these really big models with the physics in them. Uh, so we're still doing that uh, um, with this old language of Fortran, stands for formula translation, and it's still fast. 
uh, and that, you know, the running joke with Fortran is it's, it's really, really fantastic un unless you want to uh, read in information or look at the output, then it's, then it's not so good, but doing the calculations. So take, uh, take math, uh, take statistics uh, with, with the sciences and, uh, and, and learn how to code. And, and once you learn how to code, um, uh, you probably know um, probably more than I do at this point. So Kenny, you know, um, just in our daily lives, we see models. You know, if you turn on the weather at night, you can see, you know, the predictions of where the tropical depression and hurricanes going to go. You know, we see uh, predictions of sea level rise, and and we're worried about our homes or or now, you know, what's what's going to happen to COVID. So, you know, can you give us some advice? You know, it's hard to as a layman to look under the hood, you know, and how good are the models, you know? So how, what do we do to believe these or at least question them intelligently? Oh, uh, that's, um, you know, my, uh, my answer uh, 10 years ago is, would be different than my answer now um, in that, in that um, sciences and modeling in particular is uh, being extensively challenged uh, in terms of, of credibility. Um, the only thing I can offer is uh, is be very uh, careful about your source of the information about the modeling and the results. Uh, I think the key is uh, is trusted sources. Um, uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there, but there's also a lot of good information out there, and uh, and that's probably the key. Uh, the, the, the other would be, uh, well, similar sources, not just uh, people, but websites. Uh, um, uh, you, you have to rely on their, their credibility uh, because these, these are quite complicated. Um, keep in mind though, you know, you know we, eco ecological modeling sometimes in fisheries gets a, uh, you know, uh, how that we're, we're not right often enough has been told in public meetings. Yet, you know, we, we accept like 50% chance of w rain from the weather. And, and we think that's pretty good. So, so uh, you also have to think about uh, not just what is the sea level rise, but what is, uh, what, what is the kind of confidence in that? And, and then look at, at, at uh, the variability about it a bit. Um, but, but, uh, please go to uh, go to very trusted sources uh, uh, for that information. Yeah, I noticed on the weather forecast, you know, years ago they would just have one line, but now, you know, it's a little shaded line and they call it the cone of uncertainty. So at least that way yes. you could, you know, assess how wide that path is. That's right. <laughs> so here's a question. Do you do multiple runs to, to sort the, to sort of map out the space of outcomes? Uh, yes. Uh, so it's always a little deceptive because what, what makes it uh, into either reports, publications, websites, uh, the news is the final runs. And which you haven't seen are, I would say in my case, uh, the hundreds I did before that to get to that point. So that's one thing. The, the other is uh, it's a way we, we bound our answers since sometimes we don't know uh, uh, certain key assumptions. There's lots we don't know, there's lots we know, but there's certain key assumptions. And so we're able to bound our answers that way. Uh, and sometimes it's confusing be because uh, it looks like we don't know what we're talking about. Uh, but in fact, um, it's important to not only embrace uh, the prediction, but to, in, to, to embrace the certainty of the prediction. And I say certainty and not uncertainty, because uh, that, that's really a, a good way to view it. Um, uh, as academics, we, we love the uncertainties, but in terms of policy, management decisions, uh, all that, uh, it's also important to always keep in mind the certainties. So we, we do lots of simulations. And, uh, and you only see a small subset of, uh, of, of those. And um, some are for debugging the code because uh, one comma, and it'll tell you, uh, you know, problem. Um, and, and others are to bound to different scenarios uh, and, and to factor that in uh, to, uh, 
to your results and to decisions, in fact. 